In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain's Report, we are going to continue our series in the book of Daniel. And just so you remember where we left off, Daniel has been seeing these visions. And he has been looking into the future, and the, the most recent vision he had was with the four beasts. And I won't get into all the details, because if you want them, you can go back and look at the last chaplain's report. But suffice it to say, he's seeing these four beasts, and we're going to take a closer look at the fourth beast, because this is the one that the most detail is given. And the fourth beast, as described earlier in the prophecy, is a dreadful beast with 11 horns. And we've already been told that this beast represents a great kingdom. The four beasts are a representative of four great kingdoms. And so we get further confirmation of this in the verses that we're going to be looking at in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 23 through 27. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth, and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One, and will intend to make the alterations in times and in law. And they will be given into his hand for a time and times and half time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven on will be given to the people of the saints of the High One. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions will serve and obey him. So, in this passage... We're seeing a lot of really interesting apocalyptic literature explaining what's going to be going on here, and where we understand that this fourth beast is supposed to represent the fourth kingdom, that there are 11 horns, and these horns each represent a king of this kingdom. So we're going to go through piece by piece and kind of explain each part of this, because it's amazing how well the prophecy lines up with Rome, and that's the reason that it, it makes sense. And we also see sort of similar passages in the book of Revelation right before this will be happening to give us a little more clarity on this, that this is what is going on. This is the prediction that is being made here in the book of Daniel. So the first part that we see there early on in this passage is that Rome is going to devour the earth. Well, Rome had accomplished pretty much world domination at this point of both the West and the East. They had taken over all of Europe, they had taken over the populated portion, at least the populated portion that people knew about at the time, of Africa, that northern part near the sea. And they had also taken over the bulk of Asia, or at least the civilized part of Asia. Now, were there people living outside of Rome's dominion? Yeah, some random tribes or whatever, but as far as the civilized world and the world that people were familiar with, Rome had conquered the known world at the time there was really not a jurisdiction that Rome was not in charge of. And so this idea that they had devoured the whole earth the way that this beast did, there's important, it's important to understand that Rome had really accomplished world domination at this point. And then there are going to be ten kings, and then a final horn rises up, and it will be the eleventh king that is different than the others. So there are ten emperors, and we know that there is an eleventh emperor named Domitian, and he is actually the end of what most people consider that era of emperors, and there is a shift that happens after him. And we see a changing over of that, and it's true that Domitian was very different compared to the other Roman emperors. The prophecy says that he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints. Well, under Domitian, that was the height of Christian persecution by the Romans. We had seen Christian persecution by the fourth emperor and by the fifth emperor. That does happen, 
we do see that taking place. And there was some minor persecution by other emperors as well. But it really hits its stride under Domitian. And it is he that takes an active role in trying to persecute the Christians, feeding them to the lions, all this other stuff. His goal was to stamp out Christianity. And so because of that, that's the reason that this horn is given special attention in this prophecy is because that 11th emperor, Domitian, is going to be the one that is the strongest against the kingdom of God and in persecuting the Lord's saints. Now, the prophecy also says that that 11th horn is going to subdue three kings. There's a couple different ways to take this one. And honestly, I think that you could take this interpretation two different ways and both kind of make sense. But either way, there is a viable explanation, really two viable explanations for how this prophecy comes true. The first is that Domitian was credited with three major conquests that he personally engaged with while he was an emperor. Now, it's true that other emperors had military contests, uh, conquest, but with the exception of Emperor Claudius, Domitian was the only one that actually went on these conquests while he was emperor. Most of the Roman emperors sort of accomplished their military feats and then became emperor and then just sort of oversaw things from Rome. Not really unlike our president. That's something that we should be able to relate to. That's not what happened with Domitian. He actually went out into battle and oversaw the conquest himself. And he is most famous for three major military victories that he achieved while he was the emperor. So uh, obtaining these three kings, overcoming these three kings, could be a representation of those three military victories. But it's also important to note that this could also be referring to 69 AD, which is known as the, uh, as the year of the four emperors. So there were four people basically claiming that they were the legitimate emperor of Rome at the time, and emerging from that was the father of uh, Domitian, and he has a very long Latin name. It starts with a V, but I can't pronounce it, so just suffice it to say that Domitian's father was the one that kind of came out on top of that, and it was Domitian that rose to the top after his father. Now, there was an interim period where his brother was there, but he also killed his brother. And so there's, like I said, a lot of different ways that this prophecy could be interpreted. But the point is, either way that you look at it, whether it's the conquering of the three kings, the conquering of the three emperors, and being the one that really sort of rose to the top after those three emperors of Rome either died off or were removed, or you're looking at it as the military conquest of Domitian, the prophecy still fits either way. Here's another one that's important to note, that Domitian is going to rule for time, times, and half of time. The reason that's important is because Domitian reigned for 15 years. And you might say, well, well how does that really fit into time, times, and half of time? You have to remember, this was being written for the Jews, and it was being written by a Jew. How do the Jews measure time? In increments of seven. They measure the week in increments of seven. They measure the Sabbaths in increments of seven because it's part of the week. But they also have six years and then Sabbath years. And then they have the year of Jubilee. And I won't get into all the details of it, but suffice it to say, seven is the perfect number for the Jews. That's how they measure lengths of time. So the fact that he will have time, times, and a half of time means that he's going to rule for two periods of seven years, and then part of seven years. Two times seven is 14. He rules for an extra year after that. So he rules for the same time that was predicted in the scripture as well. There's a lot of things that just add up here. Court will sit for judgment. His do dominion will be taken away. So the court is going to sit in judgment of him, and then his dominion is going to be taken from him. Do you know how Domitian's reign ended? He was assassinated by the Senate, the court of Rome. And so, again, everything in this prophecy winds up playing out if you line it up with the 11th emperor of Rome. And then, uh, annihilated and destroyed forever. His legacy, because of 
his tyrannical nature and because the Senate hated him so much that they assassinated him, they intentionally sort of wrote all the good things out of his history. We have evidence of this. And so they, history remembers him as a tyrant, largely because of the history, the historians at the time, and because of the Senate and senators that were involved in his assassination. Not that he wasn't really a tyrant. I'm not saying that's an inaccurate portrayal of the history that we know, but I'm saying they intentionally did the best that they could to make sure that his legacy was buried. That even though history remembered him, they remembered him as a bad guy. And so his legacy, mostly by his own actions, were annihilated forever. And his lineage was cut off at that point as well. So his heirs did not become the new Caesar. And uh, finally, this is also about the time that Rome started to break up. That not only did his legacy as emperor go down in flames, but this is also about the time that people agree that the empire started breaking apart from itself. So his legacy of ruling, essentially the entire known world at the time, that starts really kind of dissipating after he is assassinated by the Senate. And so the Roman Empire begins to break up at this point. But then uh, there's another part of this. Greatness of all kingdoms under the whole heaven, uh, the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of God's kingdom last forever. So the main thing and the main takeaway from this whole story is that God's kingdom still stands. And we see that that prophecy came true too. The church continues to exist thousands and thousands of years after the 11th emperor has been destroyed. Because this all would have taken place before 100 AD. And here we are in the year 2000. So we're almost 2,000 years separated from this. God's kingdom is still standing. The Roman Empire, that's just in the history books. And that should be a humbling thought too. That no matter what happens to the affairs of men, look, as much as I love my country, I'm as big a patriot as you'll meet. I mean, maybe with the exception of somebody that actually served in the military. But, I mean, you look at this, and you look at the world. As much as I love my country, it's going to be destroyed one day. Maybe destroyed in the Day of Judgment. Maybe destroyed before that. I don't know. And honestly, I'm worried about that. But the point is, no matter what happens, even if America ceases to exist tomorrow, even if every country that we know of ceases to exist tomorrow, God's kingdom is still going to be here. It is still going to exist. It is still going to last forever. And that's why we can take comfort in our citizenship being first and foremost to the kingdom of heaven. Any other citizenships that we hold, whether it's to our country or to our state or to our city, those are all secondary to our primary citizenship, which is in heaven. The kings and kingdoms, the affairs of men, those are things that God is aware of. He plays a role in them. But ultimately, they come and go. They are temporary establishments that God has allowed people to make. Because when it's all said and done, when we face judgment and we sit before an almighty God, the only thing that's going to matter is, are you a citizen of my kingdom? Are you a citizen of the kingdom that really matters? And so even though God is aware of the affairs of men, and he sometimes involves himself in the affairs of men, ultimately, no matter what men do, it doesn't interrupt God's plan. God's kingdom lasts forever. Stay the course, friends. <laughs>